anniversary of an important milestone in U.S. history and for First Amendment rights. We're joining you live from the auditorium of the State Historical Society in Iowa, and we're in Des Moines. With us today are more than 200 students from schools across this state. We're joined online by students and classrooms across the country. Say hello, everybody. Hello. In December 1965, Mary Beth and John Tinker, along with their friend Christopher Eckhart, wore black armbands to school to protest the war in Vietnam. They were sent home and suspended from school. The students were told they could not return to school until they agreed to end their protest. Through their parents, the students sued the school district for violating their right to free expression. Their four-year court battle culminated in the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision, Tinker versus Des Moines <clears throat> Independent School District, 50 years ago, on February 24th, 1969. The court ruled seven to two that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. The Tinker decision <clears throat> remains a frequently cited court precedent since that time, Mary Beth and John have been advocates for student free speech. We're fortunate to have them here today to, to share their story. After their presentation, we'll invite our audience to ask questions of Mary Beth and John. For those watching outside this venue, share your questions on Twitter with the hashtag Tinkerversary or go online to iptv.org slash tinker. Please join me in welcoming John and Mary Beth Tinker. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much Kay and thank you to the State Historical Society of Iowa and to Iowa Public Television and C-SPAN and to all of you in the audience and to all of you following along out there in the US online. We're so happy to be with all of you here today. Right, John? It's a great honor and a I privilege know. to be with so many people who are celebrating the First Amendment rights, especially those of students in the schools. This is a very powerful, a very powerful moment and uh, for me personally to be participating in this. Thank you for inviting yes. me and, and I also wanted to mention the National History Day yes. which has uh, done so much to promote student That's awareness right. and student activism. Yes, and we're going to have a chance to meet some of the National History Day students in a little bit. We're going to meet students who are taking our country towards its ideals of equal justice under the law and equality for all, and that's what youth have done all through the ages, through history and now today again. And so we're so honored to be here with all of you to do that and to honor our family story. Our parents stood up for what's right, what they believe in, for justice and for love, and they weren't always so popular for doing that. So we're going to tell you the story of how this all happened. Should we get started? Let's get started. All right. Well. First of all, we were kids growing up, and of course we had wonderful qualities, like all of you. We had creativity and talents and ideas and potentials, but we needed our rights in order to unlock all of those potentials. And what are those First Amendment rights again? Somebody tell me one of the rights of the First Amendment. Freedom of? Speech. speech. Freedom of? Press. The press. Freedom of? Religion. religion. Freedom of? Assembly. assembly. And the very last? Petition, all right, let's hear it for the First Amendment, yeah. All right. Oh, they're so cute. Well, this is us growing up in Iowa. We didn't know our First Amendment rights back then, did we, John? Well, not too well at this, uh, at this age, that's for sure. <laughs> There's John on the left, he's so cute. And Leonard, who's here today, thanks for coming, Leonard. And I'm in the middle, I'm the scowly one. And then there's little Hope. Hope's here too, thanks, Hope. And Bonnie on the far side, and our parents. Paul wasn't born yet, but you're gonna see Paul later. Yeah, Paul's here too. Yeah, don't worry, we've got you. 
uh, growing up, we were, we were, we had a foundation of speaking up for things, and we had so many great friends, and one of them was John's good friend and our, our family friends, the Griffins. Well, Edna Griffin, which, who was Stanley's mother, was an amazing woman, and she was a really good friend of our mother's, and she had already won a Iowa Supreme Court case speaking up against discrimination. And so we are so happy today that we're going to have some students from Decorah, Iowa, who did a National History Day program about that. So please welcome Lauren Johnson and Grace Gerleman. Come on up, you two. Yeah. All right. My name is Grace Gerleman, and this is Lauren Johnson. And we are students from Decorah High School. We're here to talk about our experience with our National History Day project. When choosing our topic, we wanted to focus on activists in history that truly made a difference throughout communities in Iowa. And that's when we found Edna Griffin. Edna Griffin was a brave woman who fought for the equal rights of all organizations and races. She took action for injustice. Her most significant impact was her work with the Katz Drug Store. On July 7, 1948, Griffin was denied service at Katz Drug Store on the grounds of her race. She filed a lawsuit against Katz and took her case all the way to the Iowa Supreme Court, where the court would rule in her favor. She helped establish laws that made it illegal to deny service based on race. We wrote a play to present our information. We have two other people who helped us perform this play that aren't able to be with us today, Ruby Sullivan and Larson Shockey. In our play, we focused reenacting the conflict at Katz Drug Store and the civil trial. Our performance advanced to state contest where we won two awards, the African American History Award and the Leroy G. Pratt Award. We were also lucky enough to perform our play at the Edna Griffin Legacy Awards and Celebration Dinner last summer. While in Des Moines, we visited the Edna Griffin Building, which was once Katz Drug Store. Edna Griffin truly inspired us. She used her rights and the law to make the city of Des Moines a better place for everyone. When we look at our lives, we want to continue Edna Griffin's legacy. Maybe that's by standing up for injustice we see around us or something as simple as showing respect and acceptance. The play really helped us speak out about what we see around us that we don't agree with. The celebration dinner really highlighted Edna Griffin's legacy. We chose Edna Griffin and hope to share her story and the important work she accomplished. Edna Griffin is an example in our lives. She stood up for her, the rights of others, so why can't we? Changing society is a lifelong journey we're all responsible for. Help me welcome Stanley Griffin, Edna Griffin's son. All right. Woo yeah. Woo uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. And I'm pretty touched by that speech. I mean, it's like, that's what mother really wanted, wanted kids. She wanted to leave a legacy of what is right, human and civil, in the area of human and civil rights. And they were talking about her accomplishments with the Katz drug, uh, drug store case, but I want you to know, you know, who was my mother? Number one, she was the number one uh, mother in the world to myself. She, she definitely was my accompanist. I played cello through school. She, she was my accompanist on that. She was standing up for union rights in Iowa. She got here in 1947, and she stood up, uh, she stood up for the meat packers uh, workers <clears throat> to try to organize them in 1947. The work I want you to know that she did back then, she foreshadowed the modern uh, civil rights movement as you know it today. And I look back and I say, my mother was very bold. I mean, she's a, a force in action, and I think she wants to transfer that to all of you kids. Mm -hmm. Everybody can make a difference in terms of what happens. Uh, she helped with farm organization. I also grew up with farmers from Newman Grove, Nebraska, and she helped them organize a, a case against uh, Safeway stores. And I just want to let you know, she was more than just one being. She was very complicated and brilliant. And, uh, uh, graduated from high school at 14 years old and moved on from there and dedicated her life to civil and human rights, gay rights, the works, and I 
stand proud uh, to represent the Griffin family. And one other thing, my dad, Dr. Stanley Griffin, was the foundation of our family without him being a, uh, a, a sole pro uh, working for himself. Mother could not do what she did because she, uh, we would have got fired and not had, you know, not had any employment. So stand up for what is right and always remember my mother. And one last thing, a little plug here. If you want to learn more about uh, mom right now, go to Edna Griffin, uh, Edna Griffin, Iowa. And if you, you Google that, you're going to get a lot of hits on her. And uh, mm. we're writing a book right now, so there's going to be a lot more about it. And we want to help kids just like you and others excel. White, black, everybody do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stanley and Lauren and Grace, for sharing that story about Edna Griffin, who was such an influence on our lives. As young people take us towards our democratic ideals, there are people that help us along the way as examples. And Edna Griffin was one of those great examples to us. Around the time that all of this was going on and that we were growing up, there's Edna and Stanley. There were other things going on in the country that were making us very sad that other people were standing up and speaking up about. And one of those things was going on in Birmingham, Alabama. And here are some students that were there, again, taking us towards our ideals and dealing with the issue of, of racial justice, which our case is so grounded in, because this was the example that we were following. And these kids were in Birmingham, and they were speaking. Around 2,000 kids that year marched and sang songs like, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And they were marching and singing for justice. And what happened, John, some people weren't too happy about that. No, this is the uh, Ku Klux Klan. and. Uh, they were not interested in racial justice. They were interested in whites only. And the movement had to rise up to oppose that. If there hadn't been a movement of people to oppose that, that's still the world we'd live in today. Yeah, that's right. So we're very happy yeah. that. We're happy that young people stood up and opposed it, and many adults as well. And we were right. part of all that speaking up. Well, the Ku Klux Klan to punish the little children for speaking up for democracy and for justice, they had a plan and they, they planted a bomb in their church right on Sunday morning. The headquarters of the kids was the 16th Street Baptist Church. And so they put a bomb in their church on September 15th, 1963. I was 10 years old, John was 12. And these four little girls, their, their bodies were found in the church. Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise. And we were so sad about that. It's like today, what's driving a lot of young people to speak up and stand up. It's partly sadness. It's grief. It's, it's feelings that the world isn't the way that it could be and that we, we could do better. In Des Moines, Edna Griffin had started a group called the Congress of Racial Equality. And so people around the country had services to mourn for the little girls. And we had one here in Des Moines. You know, and yeah, we finally see our little brother there. There he is, Paul, right there. <laughs> St yeah. Stanley mentioned that, that uh, our families, that we grew up together. And it's, that's true. Here, here you see uh, our brother Paul. Yeah. This is uh, Phyllis Griffin, Linda Griffin, Married Me, Tinker, yeah. And our, our departed Bonnie. Our sweet uh, sister Bonnie, mm -hmm. who died in a bicycle. And I'm accident. the photographer here. I will claim credit for that shot. Oh, I should have I should have given you credit there, John. Photojournalist. Yay, photojournalist. Okay, so then that was the first time that we had a chance to wear black armbands and that we experienced wearing black armbands for being sad. It's a symbol that goes way back through history. It shows that you're sad. And there's Phyllis and Linda and all of us girls wearing black armbands that day to show how sad we were about the Birmingham children being killed and that we uh, this, could do something about it. This, so. this memorial service took place right up at the Capitol, right, right at, at the, the Capitol. plaza at the Capitol. We're about two blocks from there right now here in Des Moines. The next year was also an amazing year for young people speaking up and standing up. This time it was in Mississippi for Mississippi Freedom Summer. 
That summer, only about 3 or 4% of African Americans were registered to vote in Mississippi and throughout much of the South because of the terror of the Ku Klux Klan. So young people again spoke up and led the way, as young people do, to speak up for justice, inequality, and democracy. And it was called Freedom Summer, 1964. And, and our parents went down south to participate yeah. in that and also that's did our, our older brother Leonard. Yeah, that's right. Because our father was a Methodist minister, and we later became involved with the Quakers. Mm -hmm. And so they said, don't wait for heaven to put your values into action. Let's just do it right now on earth. Let's take action to speak up for love and all those things we preach in all religions. And so these people were doing that, putting love into action and also speaking up and using their First Amendment rights. Well, when they got there, three of them immediately disappeared. Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael and Michael um, Schwerner. And everyone suspected that the Ku Klux Klan had them, but they kept searching and searching for them. And on August 4th, the FBI found the bodies of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. It was a very, very sad time that summer. And on the very same day, something else very sad happened that was going to change so many lives in the United States forever. Off the Gulf of Tonkin, off the coast of Vietnam, a US Navy ship claimed that it had been attacked. And it turns out it hadn't been attacked, but it didn't stop the US Congress from voting almost unanimously to send thousands of troops to Vietnam. And that's really when it got started. It was already going on, but more in secret by Lyndon Johnson. But after August 4th, and all of this was going on at the same time in those mighty times, that are so much like our times that, that all of you are living in today. Well, students in Mississippi didn't think that was right. And they spoke up, and they used their First Amendment rights. And they wore these buttons to school that said, one man, one vote, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they were suspended from school for doing that. It, it was a black school. It was a segregated school of black students. And they were suspended. And a court case started working its way through the courts. It was called Burnside versus Byers. We had no idea that that case was going to influence all of our lives and all of the lives of all of you students who are, who are watching this today. Because this is the case that established the substantial disruption standard in schools that you can have free speech rights, but you cannot substantially disrupt school. Because these kids in Mississippi eventually won their case, and the court said that they should have had their right to wear those buttons and to use their First Amendment rights, because they didn't substantially disrupt school. And that's where that standard comes from. But there were also sad things continuing. Now on the news, what did we see here, John? Well, this is a picture from the war in Vietnam. During the war in Vietnam, we were confronted with pictures like this on our television sets, sets every night. And there were pictures of people that had been name palmed, pictures of villages that had been burned down. What was napalm, pots. by the way? Can you tell what that was? N napalm is a gasoline that's had things added to it to make it a, like a jelly. So when the bomb blows up and this jellied gasoline sprays out, it sticks to your skin and it burns you up. It sticks to everything. It burns up your homes. It burns up the people. It burns up the mothers and the babies, too. And we saw it every night. Uh, we saw it in black and white. But this, uh, this happened. And we watched it over and over again, and we didn't know what to do about it. There was a large march in Washington. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. went mm -hmm. on the march to Washington. And on the way back, we discussed what we could do to continue to protest the war. A man on the bus said he had heard that people were going to wear black armbands to protest mm -hmm. the war. The black armband is, a, is an old traditional symbol of mm -hmm. mourning. And people for hundreds of years have worn black armbands when members of their families have died. And they want to indicate to their society that they're in a period of mourning. 
And so we decided to wear black armbands to express our mourning for the deaths on both sides of the conflict in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And also we were trying to encourage the adoption of, of Robert Kennedy's call for a Christmas truce that year, 1965. Well, when the school system found out that we were going to wear black armbands, they, the principals got together and banned the wearing of black armbands. And we didn't know what to do, but we felt that out of conscience, we had to, we had to do it. And we also, we grew up in the Des Moines school system. And in the Des Moines school system, we were taught that America is a free country. And in, in America, we have freedom of speech. So we felt that we had the right mm -hmm. to wear the black armbands. I think we understood that we didn't have the right to disrupt the school. And so we adopted the, this black piece of cloth that, that doesn't make any noise at all, but it just represents a belief. Mm -hmm. and, and our belief was that the war in Vietnam was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so when we got kicked out of school, we appealed it to the, uh, to the school board. And this is Mary Beth, our mother, uh, behind uh, Mary Beth, our father, Leonard, and uh, Chris Singer to, the, uh, to his right. <clears throat> Uh, also, you see her black armband. Yeah, she and was suspended also, Chris I'm, Singer. I'm back behind there somewhere. I wasn't in mm -hmm. this shot. But we all attended the, uh, the school board meeting. Mm -hmm. And the school board decided to support the principals. And so uh, we had been kicked out of school. And, and our lawyer with the what was then the Iowa Civil Liberties Union, now is the American Civil Liberties Union Iowa chapter, uh, the rec recommended that we go back to school without the armbands on so that we wouldn't complicate our case with truancy issues and that we sue the school system for violating our First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. So that's what we so did. So that's what happened. Yes, and and uh, we, we lost at the district court. Uh, Judge Stevenson, uh, he felt that it was a First Amendment issue that it was a free speech issue, but that, that the school authorities had the right to make the rule about mm -hmm. that. And so we lost our case mm -hmm. at the district court, yeah. the federal district court level. Yeah. And so we appealed it mm -hmm. to the uh, circuit court in St. Louis. And uh, normally at the circuit court, the, the case is heard by a three-judge panel. Uh, the three-judge panel, because of the Burnside v. Mm -hmm. Byers, opinion where the students had won that case at a circuit court. Back in Mississippi. The, the, uh, the circuit court thought that the whole, uh, the three judge panel thought that the whole panel, the whole mm -hmm. court should hear our, the case, but they were short one judge. So instead of nine, they only had eight. And those eight judges split in their decision four to four. And so that made it very much more likely that the Supreme Court would hear the case to clear up this conflict at the circuit court level. So we appealed to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Oh, yeah, and how many cases a year does the Supreme Court take? Not very many. You tell me. Cause well, they I take think... about 80. They take about 80 they cases out of, out of 10,000. Out of 10,000. 10, so less than 1%. But, but they, they now, thought but... this was an important case because mm -hmm. it had to do with student speech rights, and there, hadn't been, there had only been one case, mm -hmm. West Virginia versus Barnett, in 1943, which ruled that students cannot be forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools. And that was the only case having to do with student speech before mm -hmm. ours. So, mm -hmm. And by the way, they, they determined that case, the Pledge of mm -hmm. Allegiance case, in 1943, yeah. in the middle of a war, right. they stood up for students' right not to say the Pledge of That's Allegiance. Right. That That's was a right. very strong case. Yeah, so. In our case, mm -hmm. the judges also split, but it was a seven to two split, yeah. and we won. Mm -hmm. It was a very resounding victory for student rights. Yes, yes, in our right. case, it was the first time that the court said that students in public schools are persons under the Constitution, and they, they were endowed with their First Amendment rights. Yeah. And so that has been the rule now for the past almost exactly 50 years. And it has really empowered student voices. Mm -hmm. Student, in our case, it was written, are the, 
majority opinion was written by Justice Abe Fortas. And he rallied, in his opinion, all of the arguments supporting free speech in a democracy. And it's a really wonderful decision. If you have the opportunity, please look that up and read Abe Fortas's decision in Tinker v. Des Moines because it's a very strong argument for freedom of speech. And beyond that, he argues that in the schools, it's especially important because students are going to grow up to be voting citizens. And it's important that students not think that we believe in the First Amendment, it's just window dressing, but we don't really believe it, yeah. that we be sincere in our belief in our support for the First Amendment. So it's a very strong opinion. Well, not everybody was so happy about us speaking up and standing up for peace. And some of them even sent us some mail, like this postcard, saying that they hate us and that we were communists. And they threw red paint at our house. And a lady even called me and, and threatened to kill me. Others stood up for us, like Lieutenant Corporal Harry Corey, who said that we should have our First Amendment rights. And this is around the time that we actually lost. I'm not sure why we're smiling, but that was at the, that was at the appeals court when we lost the case. And Chris Eckhart was there with us as well, the third plaintiff. And then the happy day, uh, February 24th, which we're celebrating this week, and we're celebrating all year. 2019 will be the 50th anniversary of this day when the Supreme Court said by 7 to 2 that neither students or teachers leave their First Amendment right to free expression at the schoolhouse gate. And one of my favorite parts of the ruling is that students are persons. Yeah. Do you like being persons, everybody? <laughs> kind of nice. Yeah, who likes that? Come on, here, let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah, there's just nothing like being a person with the responsibilities and the rights of, of the Constitution in our democracy. So it was a great day for young people all over the country, and we're celebrating that today. So thank you all for being here with us to help celebrate. We're going to open it up, I think, soon for some questions and your comments. Thank you, everybody. Here's to the First Amendment. All right. Yay. Thank you, John and Mary Beth. As Mary Beth mentioned, it's time for you now. For those watching this event live, Share your questions on Twitter using the hashtag Tinkerversary or through our online form at iptv.org slash tinker. But we're going to start with a question from the students who are here with us in the room. Does anyone have a question? All right, uh, my name is Hyde Holman. Oh, am I talking to this? Uh, I'm from Sioux City West. Uh, I was talking to my teacher earlier during our lunch period, and uh, he brought up an interesting point, and I think it kind of goes along with the First Amendment. In these more modern times where uh, social media is, a lot, is used more now uh, to cause, uh, whether it's like assembly for a protest or anything like that, uh, how does that play into the First Amendment? To yeah, you guys. social media. Social media. It's so so important. A great way to speak up and stand up for things that you believe in. And it's the courts have. There hasn't been a case at the Supreme Court having to do with students' speech and social media. There has been a case around adults and Facebook. And the court was very protective of the the man's uh, rights in that case. But I think it's only a matter of time before a case does make it to the Supreme Court. Of course, with social media, we want to be respectful with how we use that, because we want to use our rights to make the world better and not to make it more dangerous. Yeah. I, I'd like to say something uh, regarding speech generally, and it, it applies to social media, because a lot of the questions around social media speech mm -hmm. have to do with implied threats and, and harassments. And I think that you're going to find that speech is distinguished between speech which is expressing an idea and speech which is more or less an assault. Now, 
currently in assault is, a, is defined as a physical assault. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever been verbally assaulted, you understand that it has a physical effect. And, and hate speech can have a physical effect, and it can also encourage uh, violence, real physical violence. So I, my view and my uh, expectation is that speech will be distinguished more between, for instance, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't walk into a bank and say, uh, give me your money, and then claim that, you know, that that was free speech. I can't rob a person with my speech. And, and likewise, I think it's going to um, be distinguished between assaultive speech and speech which is actually conveying there an idea. Is, there is no legal definition of hate speech, and I believe, along with many others, that the limit to um, speech that is not covered should be physical violence. And so in schools, it's a little bit different because we have to maintain a, an environment there where everyone feels safe. So certain cases, there was a case in San Diego where a student wore a shirt that said, God is ashamed of your homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And the courts ruled against that, saying that that impinges on the rights of others. Because in the Tinker ruling, there are two things that the court said students still cannot do with free speech. Number one, substantial disruption of school. And that comes directly from the Mississippi Burnside case. And number two, impinge on the rights of others, whatever that means. And that's been debated ever since. But sometimes the courts can curtail your right to free speech because they say that it can impinge on the rights of others. At, so let's at, hear another one. At, at, the lower, at the lower court, some of the uh, social media cases have been regarding uh, claimed disruption in the school because of speech which occurred on the internet. And so I think that's one of the tough issues. Yeah, there are a lot, there are a lot of mixed, mixed rulings about that. Sometimes the students have prevailed, and other times no, depending on how much of a, of a threat of violence is involved. Speaking of social media, yes. <laughs> we have a question from Lynn Gramos on Twitter. How did your friends and teachers treat you when you wore those armbands? My teachers were pretty nice about it, really, and my friends were also not hostile to me. I'd have to say they were fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my friends also more or less supported mm -hmm. me. I'll, I'll tell a little story. I was, uh, I was having lunch. I, I went the first three periods of the day, and nobody said anything about my black armband. Well, my friends you know, mentioned it, but... Uh, I wasn't reported to the office or none of the teachers. If a teacher saw it, uh, one in particular I'm thinking about, he didn't report it. So uh, after gym class, my last period for the morning, I put my uh, clothes back on. I put the black armband over my white shirt. I didn't put my jacket back on. And it stood out really well. And so I went to the lunchroom like that and uh, ate lunch with my friends. They were discussing it. It wasn't a big deal, really. And some kids came over and started harassing me. And they were calling me a commie, communist, a coward, that I wasn't patriotic. And, and they, were just, they were harassing me. And, and a football player came over. And I, I didn't really know him at the time. I know him better now, but I didn't know him at the time. He said to the kids, who were harassing me said, look, you have your opinion about the war. John has his opinion about the war. John has a right to his opinion. Leave him alone. And I mm -hmm. thought that was just excellent, to have a, a yeah. football player That's good. Come on, come everybody. Over. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You're standing up for your rights. That's we have we another have question from Twitter. This is from Ashley. She's joined us on the online forum. She is at a high school in Milford, Connecticut. She asked, how did being involved in this at a young age affect and essentially change your life? Yes, it has changed both of our lives, I yep. think, because we've, it's really given us an opportunity to spend our time with young people, like today, and encouraging young people. It's been a great privilege. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ashley, it, it affected my life, I'm sure. It, mm -hmm. When, when you have done something significant at a young age, you sort of feel like you need to do something else or that's the only thing you'll be, 
you will have accomplished. So I, uh, I remained a, a lifelong peace activist. It's still my major identification as an activist. I'm uh, very opposed to militarism. I think that the large military budget is uh, very detrimental to our society. It's preventing us from addressing real issues that we have. But <clears throat> the case um, and winning it at a young age gave me confidence to kind of chart my own course. And I've done that, and uh, very happy that I was able to do that. But I'm, I'm, it's given us, both of us, the opportunity to speak to students and teachers and administrators. I, I talk regularly with uh, graduate school classes of school administrators. And, and so I am uh, very blessed to be able to have that kind of contact and influence. Let's take a question from the audience. Raise your hand if you have one, please. And that we will throw that microphone to you. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Cahalan. I go to Dowling. Um, what are your thoughts on the current problems, in, especially arising on college campuses, of groups of students actively promoting violence to censor um, speakers that they may not agree with and just violate the First Amendment of a whole opposite side of a spectrum that's kind of became a huge issue, especially right now. I'm, a, I'm against censorship of speech at college campuses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't. Col mean. Colleges should be places where people can speak and engage and, and have dialogue. And I think that's very, very important. <clears throat> Should we take another question from Twitter? Sure. Ruby Gonzalez from Lopez Early College High School in Brownsville, Texas sends us this question. What advice would you give to students who might be hesitant to speak up in their schools for fear of retribution from the school? Yeah. John, you say, you John? The, the fear of speaking up be yeah. because of well, violence, potential well, violence. Were we afraid? When we wore armbands, I know I was. I was nervous. I was in eighth grade. I was 13. I was really shy, and I was really I, nervous. I, I had the armband in my in my coat pocket uh -huh. when I walked to school because I was afraid of what somebody on the street might do yeah, as, but, as but, I was walking to school. But we had examples in our life. We had the Birmingham kids, and they were even killed for speaking up for the things that they believed in. And we had our parents who were examples to us. And so I say to kids, find a few other people who care about the issue that you care about and find out what's already going on in that issue. And when you do, it makes life so meaningful and interesting and some days even fun. I want to point out, too, that we were not isolated individuals. We no. were really part of a peace movement. In, in our childhood, we grew up I say surrounded by the peace movement. We were immersed in the peace movement. And we knew that we had the support of adults around us. We knew that there was a philosophical basis and a moral basis for what we were doing. And I think that lent us strength to do what we did. Yes, but if you feel isolated and you feel alone, and I have felt that way at times in my life, for sure, about things I cared about, mm -hmm. try to find at least one other person Maybe in your school, or maybe in your community, or someone you know that you can find a friend to stand by you, and that can make all the difference. Okay, Des Moines, we're looking at you. Raise your hand. Do you have a question? The microphone has been thrown. Hi, I'm Michael Rosenberg from Hampton Dumont, and I wanted to know what was your reaction you got from the community over your protest? Some people, some people in the community were very supportive and many were very, some were very angry. They misunderstood the idea of patriotism, I think. Some people think that patriotism means just following the policy that your um, government politicians, et cetera, have decided. And that's where the school board president made his mistake also, or a Niffenegger. He came out with a quote in the Des Moines Register saying that our government has made a decision about Vietnam and we should follow it. That's not democracy. And really this is a story of journalism also because there were so many journalists that, that spoke up and 
um, covered this case. But no, our, our role in democracy is not to just follow what has been decided. It's also to, to think about things and to criticize the decisions of politicians and the government when we feel that it's gone astray. In, in 1965, by, by the end of 65, the war fervor had really been whipped up. And the, the people were being told by the media that if we did not stop the North Vietnamese, that Cali they would be attacking California. It was called the domino theory. And, and so people whose information was only coming through the established media channels and that were receiving most of their information via the White House or the State Department, they felt that we were destroying their country. And, and they, they were afraid of people like us. And, and that's why there was so much anger directed toward the peace movement. You cowards, you communists, how could you do this to our country? But people who had a broader sense of what was going on and had a knowledge of history, I think, and, and more a sense of their own humanity and the rightness of humanity, of, of conscience. I think that we got support from them. So it's, the society is a very broad society, and so people um, acted in different ways depending on where in that broad spectrum they came from. And as the concerns and, and feelings about the war grew through the years, more and more of the military got involved in speaking up for peace. The military. And I think that's really what helped to end the war. It wasn't a student movement against the war only. It was also um, military soldiers, so many soldiers themselves. So by 1969, mm -hmm. when we won the case, it was kind of hard to be really happy about our victory because it was one of the worst years for the war. But so many soldiers by then were also speaking up about peace. So and it wasn't, this, yeah. The soldiers were coming back, and they knew what the yeah, war was. Yeah, they knew the truth. They had been, yeah. they'd seen it. They'd witnessed it with their own eyes. And so the soldiers that came back and said, no, this, this is not like we're being told it is, mm -hmm. they really did swing a yeah. lot of the public. And by 1969, the, the broad mm -hmm. center of the curve had shifted m much mm -hmm. more toward mm -hmm. the anti-war position. We have a question from Mary. She submitted this form online at iptv.org slash tinker. She's from Christopher Columbus High School in Miami, Florida. Which free speech issues still exist today and actually surprise you, even as we honor the 50th anniversary of Tinker v. Du Bois? To me, it surprises me how the rights of the First Amendment are unequally applied so much today. And um, as I travel the country, for example, speaking with about journalism, and it's actually Scholastic Journalism Week this week, so we're celebrating that. And so many students don't have journalism at all. And so there's an, an inequality about that. And um, that's what really surprises me the most. If you go to more upper class schools or students with more white students, they're more likely to have free speech rights and journalism and all of the five rights of the First Amendment. That surprises me, but there are students around the country that are working on that, and so many of them are also journalists. And we have a number of journalists here today, student journalists from, from Florida, from Texas, from Arkansas, from Iowa. And so we're all, everyone's working on that. You know, it surprised me to read uh, recently in the news, I forget where it was, somebody here will know, that a student was arrested yeah. for not pledging allegiance to the flag. And now that surprised me. Well, well can I just <laughs> say, in all fairness, the school has said that it wasn't for not saluting the flag, it was the, for the disturbance, the substantial is, disturbance. But I, I mean, I have strong feelings about this myself, and I think that, this, that the um, police were wrong. I know that the, that the teacher that was involved in that lost her job. Yes, that's right. And, and that's a consequence of the school system understanding that the student did have rights. And, yeah. and that gives me a great deal of uh, pleasure to, to know that, that the school system is more aware of that these days. Yes, definitely. And it's also, I think, an example of over-policing in the schools. And that's an issue of the American Civil Liberties Union today. The American Civil Liberties Union goes to the Supreme Court more than any organization 
And they helped us, mm -hmm. and they're helping students today with issues exactly like that. We'll take another question from our audience here in Des Moines. Which student is going to get the cube? I have it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Ulysses. I'm a student at Dowling Catholic. I was just more curious as to how you achieve the funds to go to court. You, said, you mentioned it being about four years long. Uh, yeah. Did you receive donations? Did you pay out of pocket? How did you achieve the funds? As far as the funding, the American Civil Liberties Union, the way that they um, you know, conduct a lot of their cases is with pro bono lawyers. In other words, lawyers who do donate their time. And we had a wonderful young lawyer named Dan Johnston who was not only good at um, arguing the case, but also very good at helping us to feel safe and secure, which was a problem at that time because a lot of people were threatening us. So yes, that's how. We, did, we had no money. We had a large family, and um, through the help of the American Civil Liberties Union, we were able to proceed. Our, our lawyer passed away a few years ago, yeah. but he always, he always added that uh, he was a very young lawyer at the mm -hmm. time. I believe he was 29 years old when he won a Supreme Court case. And he said, uh, if you win a case, if you win a Supreme Court case at that age, uh, the rest of your career tends to be anticlimactic. <laughs> We have a question from Kevin, submitted it online, from Lopez Early College High School in Brownsville, Texas. How did you feel when you presented your case to the Supreme Court not knowing how they were going to rule? Well, yeah. the, we didn't do that ourselves personally. Our, uh, the, we testified at the trial court here in Des Moines at the federal court. I, I testified first. and. Uh, I was a little nervous, but I wasn't, I wasn't excessively nervous. I, I had an audience full of uh, adults and students who I, know, knew, who I knew supported me. And uh, it was an interesting situation. Our lawyer was very good and very friendly, and uh, he was able to make us feel comfortable on the stand. Um, the, the school board attorney was not so friendly. Uh, <laughs> He, he was really trying to rope us into saying something that would be detrimental. But honestly, I, I felt like I could anticipate exactly where he was trying to get me to go, and I could avoid that. But anyway, at the appellate court in St. Louis and at the Supreme Court, it was our lawyer who made the, uh, the case to the court. So. Uh, we could just uh, sit back and watch. I, oh, actually, I couldn't watch at the Supreme Court because I, I missed some flights. I got bumped off of a, of a flight yeah, from that's Chicago. Right. So. That's right. Yeah, the, and the Des Moines School Board, even though they were speaking up against us then, and there were some supporters for us in the Des Moines School Board, but they've changed their mind and they've been so supportive and so been, welcoming the, the and we really appreciate that. The Des Moines has been wonderful to us. And so. you know what, they even wore black armbands um, last year, a couple of the members of the Des Moines School Board, I think after the Parkland shootings, to support the students for speaking up about that issue. Folks, we have just a couple of minutes left for questions and so somebody in the audience here asks a quick question with the cube, please. Oh. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> just a quick question, please. Hello, um, I'm Omar from Storm Lake, Omar. and I wanted to ask, did you have any family members that, um, that rejected you or shunned you after you appeared in the Supreme Court? We did not have any family members that rejected us after the ruling. Um, some people were uh, kind of mad about it, but not too many. But Omar, I'm glad you asked that question. And we were talking at lunch also about what you were talking about with discrimination and how you were worried about the internment of the Japanese and that that could happen again, maybe in our country, if we don't all speak up and stand up against prejudice and discrimination. And thank you for that. I enjoyed talking yeah. with you about that. Although we didn't, we didn't have family members that were killed in the war or even served in the war, we had a lot of sympathy for the soldiers who were in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Yeah. And, and I always want to make that distinction because you're going to hear me talk against militarism, but I'm not speaking out against the soldiers. I, I, I view the soldiers as another victim of, of the militarism that is so strong in our society. 
And I have a lot of sympathy for the people, and, and I have a number of friends who have been soldiers. I think that wraps up the question portion. Okay. I think back to okay. you, Mary Beth. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions and comments. So now, now we have a special treat. We have two students who are using their First Amendment rights to speak up about the things that they care about. And one of them is Jenny Wynn from North High School. So come on up, Jenny. North. Now, North is my old high school, yeah, so welcome. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Nguyen. I am a senior and class president at Des Moines North High School. Fifty years ago, the Tinkers not only stood up for their rights, but also for people across the nation. And that changed our lives forever. Because of your courageousness, we are able to express ourselves in what we wear, write, and say. Today, I woke up not being afraid. Not being afraid of going to school and expressing my ideas. I am glad to say that many kids today are not afraid to speak their minds. They know how to use their voice. But if it was 50 years ago, students would be expelled or suspended for speaking up for their rights. That all changed because of the tinkers, so thank you. I want to tell you about something powerful that happened at North High School. A couple years ago, Recent political issues at the time motivated student leaders to organize a walkout during school to protest. Mm -hmm. Signs were made by multiple students and everyone was united as one. I participated because I know that my voice matters and if I did not like something, I will speak up. Mm -hmm. Today, our generation are exposed to a lot more opportunities to express ourselves. From after school programs such as Movement 515 to art classes and let's take journalism for example. We have a great newspaper team here at North High, the Oracle. Students get to create their own pages and design how they like and write about what they believe in. Some of the topics that have been covered in our newspaper range from women to LGBTQ rights. These topics are usually really sensitive, but the newspaper provides a platform to express ourselves. We are young, and because we are young, people think we don't matter, and our opinions don't matter, but we do matter. We are the leaders of the next generation. So thank you to the Tinkers for standing up and letting us have the freedom of speech we get today. Thank you. And now, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. And now we're going to hear from Rebecca Schneid from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, my name is Rebecca Schneid, and as Mary Beth just said, I am uh, the editor-in-chief of The Eagle Eye, which is the newspaper at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And if you didn't know, which I'm sure most of you do, that last year on February 14th, it was the site of a shooting which killed 17 people. But I don't think that that's what Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is all, is all it's known for now. We're not known as a school of victims, we're known as a school of fighters. Fighters who understood our rights, our First Amendment rights, to speak up for what we believe in, and not only that, but we were determined and perseverant to advocate for the rights that we believe that we deserved, our right to live. And I think that if you're gonna take anything from today, it should be that it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter your age. We were 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, if you are old enough to be affected by the ills of society, you're old enough to have a say in it, and you're old enough to speak up for it and, speak and stand up for what you believe in. And I have not just seen that as the survivor of a school shooting, I have seen that as a student journalist. Before February 14th and after February 14th, I wrote about stories that were important to me and important to my classmates, whether they be uh, LGBTQ plus issues, whether they be gun violence at our school or gun violence in the other cities and on the streets, um, or rape culture, diversity, and each of these are just as important as the other. And if any of these issues or anything else is important to you, I encourage you to stand up for your rights and to also speak up for them, write about them, because I have seen that student press and student voices are the most important thing in this country right now. And they are the things that are keeping us together, and they are the things that are holding politicians and everyone else accountable for their actions. Mm -hmm. So whatever that you believe in, whether that be like any of the issues that I said or something else, write about them, speak about them, and affect change. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you to all of you for being here. And thank you for using your rights. And thank you to everyone on the online audience for using your First Amendment rights to speak up and make the world a better, safer, more just place for all of us to live. How about it, John? Absolutely. Yeah. I, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for caring about First Amendment rights. Thanks for caring about the world. And you are the future. I know mm -hmm. any number of adults have told you that before, but it's really true. And you're also and, the present. And Let you're the present, that. and we're really counting on you. Yeah. We really are. Yeah. So go out Thanks. there and, and yeah. make the world a better place. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. John and Mary Beth, on behalf of Iowa Public Television, the State Historical Society of Iowa, and young people across the country, thank you for sharing your time, energy, and story with us today. To the students in this auditorium, and to those of you who joined us online, thank you for your questions and your participation.